So, uh, hi and welcome all today uh, for today's seminar. It's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Stephanie Forkel as our speaker. Stephanie uh, is a group leader uh, and the team leader in language sciences at the Donders Institute uh, of Brain Cognition and Behavior. And that's in Netherlands, uh, part of uh, Radboud, uh, Radboud University. Uh, so in the US, uh, that's equivalent to an associate professor. Uh, so in 2020, she became a visiting professor at TUM Munich, uh, that, that's Technical University of Munich, uh, and a senior lecturer at King's College London. Uh, she also completed her habilitation uh, last year. HDR, as most of you know, is, is the highest university degree in France, and uh, it's almost like, like a second PhD with a, with a defense and, and everything. Uh, Stephanie uh, is really passionate about teaching, and she runs uh, online workshops on brain anatomy, tractography, and has organized several workshops, symposia, and conferences, uh, and also organized the first ever brain hack, uh, which is now gaining popularity in London. Uh, she's also been accredited as a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. Uh, so incidentally, Stephanie also gave a lecture in a class that uh, Marco, David, and I run on brain imaging and brain stimulation, and her lecture was very well received. And, and so it's no surprise that this year she won uh, the OHBM Education in Neuroimaging Award. And I should also add that this award also recognizes her contributions to CN seminars it, it's a YouTube channel that you created, you organize and, and run uh, on YouTube. And so gi giving a talk on, on Zoom here uh, sh should be very easy for you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so this year she was also elected as the program chair uh, for OHBM. Uh, Stephanie uh, is on the editorial board at Cortex and Brain Structure and Function, as, as well as a book section editor for a forthcoming encyclopedia of the human brain. Uh, and the section is human uh, neuroanatomy. Uh, Stephanie uh, does a lot of outreach in the scientific community at large. And, and recently, she's also co-founded an NGO, uh, neurosciencealliance.org, uh, that acts a, a, as a liaison with clinicians and academics from low to middle income countries uh, to improve equitable access to research. Uh, Stephanie, while, while we were uh, gathering for the seminar, received a, a great news uh, publicly, uh, and I, I think she can, I, I think the embargo is now lifted, so maybe she can publicly talk about it. So, sh so she'll break us the news, so I, I won't steal her thunder. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have Stephanie here uh, for the seminar. Let's welcome Stephanie. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation and uh, the lovely introduction. Let me share my screen with you. Here we go. Um, so yeah, it's it's a great pleasure to be back to uh, give a talk uh, for a slightly different audience. Um, and the presentation today is about brain mapping brain connections from anatomy to the clinic. Um, and as you already kindly introduced our YouTube channel, I just wanted to highlight it. <laughs> So um, there's a couple of slides where you see the logo, and that just means that on the channel, there's an entire talk for you to dive deeper into the topic. Now, um, as you mentioned, I'm quite passionate about anatomy, and there is many different ways we can study anatomy. Uh, we can look at the surface of the brain, we can cut through the brain and look at the deep uh, gray matter structures inside the brain, we can look at the connections, and we can look from a functional perspective. Now, for the sake of this talk, uh, which is about brain connections, I'm gonna focus solely on connectional anatomy. And some of the terms that we use are quite specific to connectional anatomy uh, and are labeled differently when you come from a functional background. Now, in, in order to look at the white matter of the human brain, there's only two methods that we have available. And I briefly want to introduce them. So the first one is white matter postmortem dissections using the so-called Klingler technique. Um, and that's a quite elaborate uh, method to use because you need to thaw and freeze the brains multiple times. And so quite a long cycle to go through to prepare them for the dissections in an ideal way. Now, obviously, if you just put the brain in a bucket, it gets squished. So ideally, it's suspended on a thread around the, the brainstem. 
and uh, it's just floating in a bucket. Now, this is simply the preparation time, uh, but then once you actually have a brain that was prepared in the right way, what it takes is the specimen, obviously, ideally prepared in the right way, a lot of patience, uh, the right instruments, and ideally a microscope. Now, why patience? Because even for people who are very skilled in this technique, it does actually take quite a bit of time to uh, go through it. So I personally find it extremely therapeutic and I love just sitting there for a, a day and doing the dissections, um, but it does take time and quite uh, a deep anatomical knowledge. Now, the instruments, as you can see in the picture here, are not extremely sophisticated. We usually prepare them ourselves um, by just preparing the different spatula. And depending on who you observe doing it or if you do it yourself, um, we all prepare them in kind of the same way, but everyone has their own little tweaks of how they prefer to do it. Um, and then, as I said, the, the microscope is a fantastic tool to use and it offers a lot more uh, detailed dissections but you can also do the dissections uh, without a microscope or without the help of a microscope, um, especially if one is only interested in the large uh, connections in the brain. So I wanna use uh, the next couple of slides to walk you through it and show you step-by-step step how we do those dissections. So the first step is that we have to get our bearings with the anatomy, we need to know where we are in the brain. And then obviously uh, the easiest landmark to identify is the sylvian fissure or the lateral fissure that is shown in blue here uh, that separates the frontal and the temporal lobe. And then the second fissure that is easy to identify is the central sulcus separating the frontal and the parietal lobe. Now, once we have those two landmarks, then we can easily fill in the anatomy around it. So once we have the central sulcus, we know exactly where the precentral and the postcentral is. When we have the sylvian fissure, we know that at the tip of, of the sylvian fissure, at the, the posterior end, we have the supramarginal gyrus. And then if we identify the next sulcus in the temporal lobe, uh, which is the wiggly yellow line here, we have the superior temporal sulcus. And we know that at the end of this, we have the angular gyrus, which makes the area in between, and now the superior temporal gyrus, and so on and so forth. Now, once we have identified the superior temporal sulcus, this is a good place to start with the dissections. And the way we do the dissections is that we slowly, very slowly peel away the cortex, exposing the superficial white matter underneath, which is also called the U-shaped fibers. Now we do that then following a C-shape all the way through the parietal lobe towards the uh, frontal lobe, and you slowly carve away the cortex, slowly and carefully, <laughs> I should say. Now, once we do this, we end up with um, something like this. So as you can appreciate, especially if you've never seen it before, now it's quite difficult to see um, where we are in the brain. So I'm just going to put some rough landmarks in there to indicate the frontal lobe, the parietal occipital and temporal lobe. And I'm just going to put our fissures back in. And now we know where we are. So what you can nicely see here is the white matter that is uh, in between neighboring gyri, the so-called U-shaped fibers, and you can see them on the top of the slide, and they're really arching from one gyrus around the sulcus into the next gyrus. Now, what you can also see here quite nicely is the arcuate fasciculus. Now, the arcuate fasciculus is called arcuate, which means arching from Latin, and it has this name because it's arching from the frontal lobe around the sylvian fissure and diving down into the temporal lobe. Now, the first thing you can appreciate if you've never seen this before is that the white matter actually does look a bit lighter than the gray matter, but also it doesn't come in the colorful pictures 
in, in those colorful colors that we see in, in textbook pictures. Um, but they all look kind of the same and seeing the exact boundaries between the white matter is actually quite challenging sometimes. Now, um, from here, we can now continue and remove the frontal and parietal and temporal operculum. Um, and that will um, remove also the insula behind the operculum and to expose the external capsule. Um, what we can also do is cut the arcuate at the level of the um, lateral fissure, and that will expose the white matter underneath the arcuate fascicle. And when we do this, we get an image that is looking a bit more like this. Um, it's also now drier, so it's easier to see the, the white matter and the differentiation. But what you can nicely see here is that, again, we have the U-shaped fibers on the top of the brain connecting neighboring gyri. And then we have the longitudinal association connections. The first one is the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is a frontal parietal connection. Then you see the arcuate that, as I said, we cut. And then underneath, you can see those beautiful radiations from the internal capsule and the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. Again, seeing a clear differentiation between the two, as I mentioned, is difficult uh, with the naked eye. And that's why a microscope sometimes is very helpful. Now, when you focus towards the back of the brain, more the occipital lobe, you can see that we also have white matter that has a uh, vertical orientation, um, so superior inferior orientation, which here is the vertical occipital fasciculus. Now, depending on where you take away uh, the cortex and the white matter, you obviously find different white matter structures. So this is just to give you an overview of the lateral aspect um, of a Klingler dissection. Now, once we're done with the Klingler dissection from the lateral aspect, the brain slice that you're left with is already quite thin. So you have to be very careful not to break the specimen at this point. So obviously this is a fascinating method and it works. As you can see in the picture, we can nicely identify individual white matter connections. But there are some downsides. The most obvious downside is it's invasive by nature. It's a post-mortem method. So it's very difficult to um, get specimens. And also if we make an error, um, we're basically wasting a brain um, beyond the fact that it's a good learning curve. Um, it's also quite time consuming, as I mentioned, uh, both in the preparation that it takes to prepare the brain the right way by thawing and freezing it, but also the time it actually takes to sit down and do the dissections. As I said, it can easily be a full day of uh, dissecting the lateral and the medial aspect of the brain. It also requires a deep anatomical knowledge and skill. So when I first uh, started doing it, I thought I knew my anatomy because I learned my books by heart. But actually, when you then have to look at the 3D brain and not the 2D pictures in a textbook, but also once you take away a lot of the references, um, it does actually get quite difficult. Um, because by the virtue of the method, we remove the cortex, um, it's difficult to determine the cortical terminations of the white matter, um, simply because the gray matter was peeled away in the very first step of the method. And then it has also been argued that this continuous cycle of freezing and thawing the brain might actually artificially introduce artifacts, um, because obviously the, there's a lot of water in the brain. And when water freezes, we all know it expands. Uh, and then if you thaw it again, it shrinks again. And this physical uh, extension and reduction in the white matter might actually introduce um, some artificial boundaries or push white matter closer together that in the living human brain isn't actually close together. So why do we still do it if it's that difficult and time intensive? Well, because it is an excellent and complementary research tool for neuroanatomical studies. 
Um, and as I mentioned, it's a fantastic tool to really learn the 3D anatomy. Now, what makes me say it's a complementary tool? Well, in the beginning, I mentioned there is only two methods we have available for the human brain to look at the white matter. And as you can see here, we have the postmortem Klingler dissections that I've been doing for over 16 years. But the second method that we can use to look at the white matter is so-called in vivo tractography. Now, you can already see that one is postmortem and one is in vivo, which is a nice complementary uh, situation that we have here. But also, uh, they complement each other in, in other ways. And what I highlight here are the first papers where we actually used both methods to uh, describe the anatomy of some connections for the very first time in the living human brain. So what you see here is the first uh, frontal parietal um, definition of the um, superior longitudinal fasciculus in the human brain. And we published that back in 2011. Um, and, and in the paper, we also looked at the postmortem dissection to verify what we see with tractography. The same we did for other connections, the U-shapes uh, structures, for example, back in 2014. And then one thing that is beautiful about both the, these methods is that you can also uh, do it between species. So we can do comparative anatomy studies, um, for example, between uh, macaques and humans. So this is... Uh, the two methods that we have available, and we're going to come back to why we don't have more. But I first want to give you a little overview of why we actually need to look at the white matter in the first place or what we can gain from it. So one thing that we uh, can get from studying the white matter of the human brain is that we can formulate new models of how the brain works. It also lets us uh, study uh, atypical cases, so patients that present with a deficit but not the corresponding textbook lesion in a disconnection mechanism. And I'm going to show examples of these four points uh, in a minute. We can also use it to do disconnection symptom mapping. And finally, we can use uh, diffusion weighted imaging tractography to study inter individual variability. So let's have a look at uh, point number one, the new models. So you're probably all familiar with these three famous cases. We have Phineas Gage on the left, who unfortunately for him had the iron rod that you can see in that picture fly through his skull and his brain, damage his frontal lobe and change his personality, which made him uh, the famous case um, that placed personality inhibition executive functions in the frontal lobe. Then we have Broca's patients. Here's one of them. And here's a lovely picture of Nina Drunkers with the other one, where she actually went to Paris to scan that very brain. Um, and those two brains have in common that they had a stroke to the frontal lobe and lost the ability to articulate beyond um, a syllable. Basically, so that's why this patient is also famously known as patient Tom. Now, that's the famous case that placed language articulation in the inferior frontal lobe. And then uh, the last one in that triad is uh, patient HM, as he's better known, who was treated for um, his epilepsy and they surgically removed the uh, medial temporal. Uh, part of the medial temple of the two hippocampi, and he became unable to form new memories. So these are the famous cases, and they firmly grounded the model, the brain model of localizationism, whereby one part of the brain is responsible for one function. Now, if we look at the white matter in these three famous cases, we can see that indeed the gray matter was damaged, but that very lesion had a much more wider impact on 
the connectivity in the brain. So in Phineas Gage's case, we can see that, yes, it damaged a lot of the white matter within the frontal lobe, but it also disconnected the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe by uh, disconnecting the uncinate fasciculus, for example. Same for Broca's patient. When we look at the white matter that was affected by those lesions, we can see that the arcuate fasciculus, the classical language pathway was affected, but also the superior longitudinal fasciculus, uh, the third branch, the frontal Aslan tract that is connecting uh, what is known as Broca's area and the inferior frontal gyrus to the supplementary motor area, and also other shorter connections like the frontal orbiter polar tract. And for patient HM, we can see that it wasn't only his hippocampus that was affected bilaterally, but actually his entire limbic system was affected and disconnected by this lesion. So this is an example, one of the examples of why we need to look at um, the white matter network in the brain. But I want to give you another example why we need to uh, update our models. Um, and here you see the anatomy of the visual system and the anatomy of the auditory system. And each box is a uh, cortical area and then obviously the lines representing connections or circuits between them. And you can see that our understanding of the visual and auditory system is extremely complex and extremely well mapped. Now, if we, however, accept that for primary functions like vision and auditory, which are arguably easier than higher cognitive functions, the underlying anatomy is so complex, then arguably it is high time we updated um, what we think the language network in the human brain looks like. Now, this mismatch is obviously in part owed to the fact that we only have two methods available in the living human brain to study functions in the brain or the white matter functions in the brain. And that is because we cannot um, apply a lot of the methods that we can apply in animal research to map vision and auditory systems in the human brain. However, we can use tractography in the living human brain. And actually, when we apply this to the language network, we have come a long way. So from the classical 19th century model of we have Broca's in the frontal lobe, Wernicke's in the temporal lobe, and those two are connected by the argued fasciculus, we have come to a more complex language model where in the early 2000s, Marco Catani added a indirect segment, so the anterior and the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus that stop in the parietal lobe. So they're both more lateral compared to the long segment of the arcuate. But then also uh, in more recent years, with the help of complementary um, methods, for example, through neurosurgical approaches, lesion studies, or direct uh, electrical stimulation, many more pathways have been added to the language network in the human brain. So these are a couple of examples of why looking at the white matter would actually help us update our models of the brain. Now, I mentioned atypical cases. So here is one example where we see a patient that presented with a Broca's-like aphasia meaning that the patient um, could understand language, could comprehend, um, but couldn't really articulate or had very effortful um, speech outputs. Now, what you can see is when you look at the T1 on the left, is that Broca's area as such is not affected by the tumor. When we, however, did the tractography of that lesion, you can see that even though the tumor itself is not encroaching on the white matter, the edema around it is actually affecting the long segment of the arcuate fasciculus and the anterior segment. And that can explain the presentation with a Broca's-like aphasia despite Broca's area being intact. Now, another application of where we need to look at white matter is the so-called disconnection symptom mapping approach. And here I just want to 
briefly talk you through uh, what we mean by that. So I highlighted the insula, which is one of the only cortical areas that's still visible in this um, image. And oftentimes uh, when I go to the clinic, um, there is a note saying there's a patient with a insular lesion and some deficit. But a insular lesion can mean many different things depending on where that lesion is actually extending to. So if we assume that that very lesion in the insula is extending ventrally, it might disconnect uh, white matter like the optic radiations. And then that would lead to a clinical presentation with hemianopia or visual agnosia, for example. If that very same lesion have extends medially, we're now looking at a disconnection of the internal capsule or the spinal tract, depending on the level you look at it. And now you would expect that patient to present with deficits such as hemiparesis, somatosensory deficit. If that very same insula lesion have it extends dorsally, we're now looking at a disconnection of the arcuate segments and that patient would present with a language deficit. So the point here is that the clinical presentation changes depending on the type of disconnection. And that's why it's important to look at individual white matter connections. Now, point number four, I said why we need to do it is because we uh, can study variability. And I just briefly want to make this point, um, what I mean by variability, because I quite often get challenged on what variability is and that it has different definitions for different people in different um, fields. So when I talk about neurovariability, what I mean is that our brains are different. And to illustrate that point, I highlighted here in the MNI template brain, my own brain and a textbook brain, the classical language areas and the lateral fissure between those areas. And what you can see is that we have the same kind of areas and the same kind of parts of the brain, but the exact location and the relationship between them is actually quite variable. Now, this variability is even exaggerated when we look at the white matter. So here you see, again, the arcuate fasciculus, the three segments of an MNI template brain. Next to it, my rather pathetic looking arcuate in comparison. But then we have the Gray's Anatomy textbook, which is one of the standard textbooks for anatomy still to this day. And you can see that in this textbook, the arcuate is so variable, it actually goes to all the parts of the brain, all the lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes are all uh, connected by it. And the arcuate even is called the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which nowadays we know, given the um, anatomical description, the superior longitudinal fasciculus is frontal parietal, and the arcuate, as I mentioned, is arching around. So there was some confusion in the literature. Now, this is obviously my brain versus the rest of the world, but we actually mapped systematically the variability in the healthy population. And what we demonstrated in this paper is that variability is not homogeneous across the brain, which can be seen here by the warm and the cold colors on the cortical surface on the top um, and the white matter highlighting areas of low and high variability. Now, there is two things that are important here. The first one is that the areas that tend to be more variable tend to be the ones that were identified when neuroimaging and lesion studies as areas that are relevant for higher cognitive functions. And the second thing is that we don't have variability that is equally distributed across uh, the brain. And you see this beautiful gradient from older parts of the brain and the deep in the middle of the brain uh, being more alike between us. And then uh, this uh, radiating gradient towards the outside where there is more variability. Now, obviously what I'm showing you here is a group level white matter map. And I was very much interested in the individual white matter tracts and how the variability in individual tracts is actually associated with cognition in health and in disease. Now, this uh, 
was supposed to be a quick, uh, fun project for like a weekend. It ended up taking us an entire year because there was a total of 126 studies that looked at correlation between uh, variability in the anatomy and differences in cognitive functions in healthy controls, neurological and psychiatric patients. Um, and there's three things that I want to highlight from this study. Uh, the first one is that most of what we know about the function of the white matter, we actually learned in clinical populations. So you can see here, 45% of the studies were conducted in neurological patients, 29 in psychiatric patients, and only 25% in healthy controls. Now, the second thing that the study showed was that not all brain connections are studied equally across the cohorts. So if we look at the first one, the cortical spinal tract, for example, is a very prominent connection in neurological um, studies, but a lot less so in psychiatric uh, populations or healthy controls. Now, some of the tracts are generally prominent, like the cortical spinal tract, the uncinate, the corpus callosum, they're prominent uh, overall, while other connections like the frontal pathway are a lot less prominent. And there's various reasons for that. One of them is that the anatomy is not as well described. Um, also, it's not in included in uh, many of the automatic brain atlases. Um, and the other thing is that it's a smaller connection. So we needed to have better quality data to actually be able to reliably dissect it. Now, the third thing that we showed in the study, and I'm just gonna zoom in so you can see it better, is that we were able to show that variability in anatomy is actually related to variability in cognitive profiles. And importantly, that when this connection is damaged, it caused uh, variable clinical symptoms. And we see this here with the um, arcuate fasciculus, the three segments. And you can see that even though it's a very prominent language connection, language is not the only function that this tract does. So again, there is no one tract, one function association. Now, what these studies and some uh, have demonstrated is that studying the white matter is a reliable measure of variability in anatomy and that it is related to cognitive differences in health and in disease. So I want to give you just two examples of the clinical work that we have done. The first one being stroke and the second one being neurodegeneration. So uh, starting with the stroke study, this is a study where we uh, recruited aphasic patients in the acute stage and then followed them up um, after six months and again after a year. And what we were able to demonstrate here is that taking anatomical variability into account doubled the accuracy of predicting recovery. So let me talk you through it uh, briefly. What you see uh, in red are the individual patients. On the x-axis, you have the size of the arcuate fasciculus in the healthy right hemisphere. And then that is plotted against the language recovery six months after symptom onset. And I highlighted three patients for you. Patient number one, you can see, was a 20, sorry, 59-year-old man who um, had quite a thin arcuate connection in the right hemisphere. Patient number two was an 81-year-old woman with a thicker connection in the right hemisphere, and her recovery was slightly better. And then patient number three, 87-year-old woman, had a beautifully thick arcuate fasciculus in the right hemisphere, and actually, according to the neuropsychological assessment, fully recovered back to a normal level of language. Now, what is interesting here is that if you look at clinical and demographic data, we can predict about 30 to 40% of the variance in recovery. By adding in the size of the arcuate fasciculus in the healthy right hemisphere, we were actually able to bring this up to nearly 60%. Now, the second study I wanted to show you is um, a study in primary progressive aphasia patients or neurodegenerative patients. And the classical model of conduction aphasia. So conduction aphasia was the first um, 
disconnection syndrome that was described, whereby patients would be able to articulate, so the inferior frontal gyrus was intact, they were able to comprehend, so um, posterior temporal areas were intact, but what they couldn't do was repeat what they heard. So the original uh, model of disconnection uh, actually concluded that the arcuate fasciculus did not forward the information from the temporal to the frontal lobe to repeat what was heard, hence the name conduction aphasia. However, with the emergence of CT imaging, uh, that picture was slightly repainted and we had many reports of patients with lesions in the inferior parietal lobe presenting with conduction aphasia. So the question here really was, uh, what is going on? Is it the cortex or is it the white matter? So we set out to study both the arcuate fasciculus and the cortical areas for language. And when we did this, we found absolutely no correlation between repetition deficits and the long segment of the arcuate fasciculus, which goes against 150 years of conduction aphasia uh, theory. Um, what we, however, saw is that when we looked at the indirect segments, so the anterior and posterior segments, we actually did see a correlation with repetition deficits. For the cortical areas, the only area that survived multiple comparison correction was the supra, supra marginal gyrus in the inferior parietal lobe. So when you put us all together, what we actually had to conclude was that we had to rewrite 150 years of uh, language in the brain and take out the arcuate fasciculus. And we came up with a new model whereby you can have a lesion to a cortical area or the indirect segment of the arcuate fasciculus, and both would give you a repetition deficit. Now, importantly, the flavor of this deficit will be different depending on where the lesion is and which other uh, networks are affected by this. So this is a very brief summary of what we have done. Now, the question is, where do we go from this? What do we do with this? Um, and I just want to give you five possible ways forward. So the first one is that it's always worth to challenge what we think we know, as you've seen with the last study that I showed you. Go back and reanalyze data or come up with new concepts of explaining atypical cases, for example. Now, the second way forward is that for many, many years, we specialized in one method and we didn't really had a way to connect our different methods, particular structure and function were hard to actually bring together. And um, we're now at a fantastic eight where we have now the data and the tools to try and really combine uh, different uh, imaging modalities and try to integrate them to get a better understanding of the complexity of the brain. And then coming back to the exciting announcement <laughs> at the very beginning, this paper was literally just published a minute before we started this talk. Um, and what we argue in this paper is that uh, we need to have conceptual advances. Um, and we have seen with the language network that a modular approach to a language where, where we have Broca's, Wernicke's and Geschwind's area doesn't fully capture the complexity of language in the brain. The same goes for a hierarchical model, which captures more of the complexity, but is still limited. But actually, the complexity that we have in language is best captured by an integrative model, where we have a lot more flexibility in the system to activate and deactivate networks to come up with the beautiful complexity that we have to communicate with each other. And then <clears throat> uh, the fourth way forward is that we can use structography to look at comparative anatomy and thereby getting a new insight into the evolution of the brain and the evolution of human cognition related to anatomy. And then 
Finally, um, the point uh, that I always try to make is that we are better together. We are more than the sum of our individual parts and we should uh, use that <laughs> work together. So we're really advocating to pool resources, especially for clinical research, pool data sets, pool knowledge, and uh, become a little network just like the brain, um, but as uh, individual scientists across the globe. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I invite you to read the new special issue in science all about brain connectivity. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephanie, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, did you, while you were talking, actually take that picture and, and put it with a special issue? <laughs> I don't know how you did that, but that, that's um, amazing. No, uh, as, so they, they didn't actually share the cover with us, um, but I spent all day giving interviews. And at some point, I convinced one of the journalists to share the cover with me. Huh. Great, great. That's how we got it. <laughs> great. Uh, congratulations. So I, I guess that Thank will you. be a whole separate new talk uh, much later. But, but for now, uh, do people have questions? Uh, please free, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Hi, Stephanie. It was a great talk and a pleasure to listen to you. Can you tell me something about this? frontal Aslan track that people are talking about in terms of language. So uh, I briefly showed it on one of the slides. So the frontal Aslan tract has the name because it goes from lateral uh, inferior frontal gyrus and then bends inward towards the um, supramar no, supramarginal, sorry, the supplementary motor area. Oh. Um, so it has this, this nice shape. Um, now, the anatomy of the frontal Aslan tract, or the fat, as it's often called, um, has been refined. So there's this direct connection, and then we have uh, a series of U-shaped connections as well. And the frontal Aslan tract has been implicated for um, planning and initiation of motor sequences related to language and speech. So that means it's implicated in stuttering, for example, and if it's stimulated during um, neurosurgery, for example, you can also elicit um, speech arrest in patients. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, so, so while people are thinking, still thinking, do you, and maybe this is too much of an ask. Uh, do you want to summarize maybe in five minutes or less? Uh, wait a minute. So I, I see another question here. Maybe maybe let's take that question first in chat. You briefly touch on the nuances between the SLF and the arcuate fasciculus. Some of the literature describes the SLF 1, 2, and 3 as a separate entity, while others describe the anterior. Sorry. Arcuate fasciculus, long segment, posterior segment, complex together. Um, yes, so this is not an easy task, and it doesn't help that, as I mentioned during the presentation, throughout history, there have been some uh, mistakes introduced in the literature. Um, but classically speaking, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, one, two, and three, as the name suggests, is longitudinal. So they are frontal parietal connections. While the arcuate, as the name implies, is arching around a Sylvian fissure, diving down into the temporal lobe. Now, usually that differentiation has been made quite clear in the literature, um, but the sticking point is the SLF3 and the anterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus. And when you look at most atlases available, these are actually the same connection. <clears throat> so then uh, you find the different label in the literature, depending on whether people looked at language, in which case they would call it the anterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus, or if they looked at visual spatial functions, for example, in which case they would call it the superior longitudinal fasciculus number three. <clears throat> 
Great. Uh, this uh, this question, I also had that question. So that means all our atlases, uh, the tractography atlases, they need to be now changed. Or I, I don't know if any there's a new atlas that actually does this distinction. At, at least as far as I, I know, I, there's none. Uh, there is one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. from our group oh, great. All right. currently working on uh, an updated atlas um, and the whole argument about SLF versus um, Arcid you can also find in my brain structure and function review from this year the, the systematic review there's an entire paragraph on what happened how we got it wrong and how we should fix it great great this, this is very helpful so I guess I was going to ask you uh, if you can summarize uh, this, this science paper uh, in five minutes for all our audience so that they are primed. So when they actually read it, they know what to look for. Uh, so, so, the, uh, so, so my point of view was, so you mentioned this modular, hierarchical, and integrative. So in your answer, if you can kind of maybe, we know what modular and hierarchical means, but what, what is this integrative approach and how, how one can think about this? So um, the idea really is that the modular system doesn't have enough flexibility to capture the complexity that we can observe in our behavior and cognition. And introducing the white matter, as was done with the hierarchical model. So for example, if we take repetition, you can go from temporal to frontal via the direct route, or you can take a little break in the parietal lobe and then go frontal. Um, that still doesn't capture the complexity that we can see. And it would just make the white matter modular as well. So rather than ascribing one function to one brain area, we're then ascribing one function to one track. So the integrative system really sees this network of areas and connections that activate and deactivate depending on the task that is demanded. Um, and that also allows for that flexibility that an area or a tract or those two together can actually interact in different ways and depending on what else they're connected to for different cognitive functions. As we have seen in the review, the ARCID, for example, is very dominant in language, but it also activates for other cognitive functions. And this flexibility in the system or integration, as we call it in, in the paper, um, you can only get if you look at the brain as a whole in a network approach. So, so this kind of, we need new tools to study and understand this? Uh, or, or the, these tools from so brain connectivity network analysis, uh, how much of these uh, can, can be applied here and what's their limit really? Uh, so we're, we're definitely not saying everything we've done so far is no good and we have to scrap it all and redo it. Um, but as I've shown you with the example of the three famous cases, the only difference to the different type of result was that in the first case, we looked at it with the brain model of a localizationist view where one area does one function. And then in the second example, you had a more network-based approach where uh, we looked at the network that was affected by the lesion. So what we're advocating here is not to say everything before this paper was wrong and we have to redo completely everything, but change the um, approach to the data and the science that we have and reanalyze it in a different way. And by doing that, we can then, for example, explain more of the variance and recovery when we look at the network rather than just where is the lesion in the brain. Cool. That's great. Uh, any other questions? I have another question. Um, so you, there's one slide that you show in which you show how many studies came out from neurological populations and how many studies came out when it comes to white matter tracks from healthy participants. And not surprising, it's mostly clinical populations, not healthy participants, because, you know, it's not, 
that easy to study the functions and even, I mean, the anatomy can be studied, but certainly the functions to find minor tracks. But what about combining brain imaging with things like brain stimulation and see whether or not you can change parameters like fra fractional anisotropy? Um, I know there's been some attempts to do this. Uh, it's not something that is becoming very successful. So I'm worried that maybe it's not very easy to do or maybe people are not getting good results. What can you tell us about it? Um, it's definitely a, a valuable attempt to try and bring it together. Um, we have those indirect methods where you uh, get the tractography of a patient and then do the surgery, do the mapping and try to relate it back. But that obviously comes with the limitations that a uh, the position of the head might be different, introducing some variants, but also once you open the skull, obviously there's brain swelling, brain shift, uh, you name it. So there, there's that issue of basically registration, this one-to-one -one mapping between modalities. Um, we also have the issue of scaling. So some of the methods uh, that actually try to do it, for example, in navigated TMS, where you have the structural uh, MRI scan and then you, the basically functional interruption of um, language by introducing a speech arrest, for example, you still have a margin of error in the registration, which is now quite limited. But then you won't ever stimulate the white matter, for example, because you're quite limited to the surface of the brain. So um, those are a couple of the challenges that we have, especially in the clinical setting. Time is also a challenge. Um, if we could uh, image anyone during a surgery, um, that would be fantastic to have a better match. But obviously, there is time, financial and practical, practical limitations in, in actually achieving this. Um, so there is many efforts ongoing. Um, our own group, for example, has uh, developed a tool where you can project functional imaging or resting state imaging onto the white matter to get a better idea of the functional network that is involved in, in, a, in a task. Um, but there's still plenty of things that need to be done in SASTA to really make it a good match. All right, thank you. Welcome. Any, any other questions? So, so you touched upon something that I was actually going to ask your thoughts about fMRI as a modality and how do you think about it when we want to conduct studies, uh, either population-based studies or clinical studies in conjunction with tractography. And so how, how do you, yeah, your thoughts on this? Uh, um, I think functional imaging certainly has its uh, space and usability. Um, it shows the areas that are involved in a task, not necessarily the areas that are essential for a task. Um, and I've seen good studies combining fMRI and I've seen bad studies combining fMRI with tractography. Um, one thing, for example, that is not the best idea is to uh, use the functional areas as a seed for tractography simply because that won't ever give you the full network that is involved, but just a proportion of a connection. Uh -huh. um, and arguably, it could well be that just a part of a tract is involved in a function, but then uh, you won't ever be able to definitively answer that question using this approach. So it's much better to analyze both methods to the best of their standard and then try and combine them. Um, yeah. That's... So, so you're advocating going from tractography to fMRI and not the other way around so much. Uh, not necessarily going from one to the other, but don't, don't use one to inform the other. Um, so if you have um, a full functional analysis and a full tractography analysis, fantastic. Um, and then try to combine it. Uh, for example, like we did with the um, new toolbox that we have where you project the function onto the white matter. But we, uh, 
we don't limit the white matter analysis to only the functional activation areas. Um, likewise, I wouldn't go the other way around because we tend to do whole brain white matter and then how do you get back to those functional areas? Um, so I really advocate that you analyze whichever method you have um, to the best current standard, get the best possible results and then combine it rather than mix it in the early stages. Okay, cool. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, so, so if not, let's uh, thank Stephanie once again, and, and hopefully we can invite you later down the line to talk about your new findings and <laughs> perhaps a, a new set of papers uh, then. Uh, so thank you very much for coming, uh, taking your time and, and showing us your work. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thanks.